It's the Pacers. It's the Bucks. It's the first round of the playoffs. Let's dive into the series from the Pacers perspective. Do the regular season games between these two teams matter? What are the key matchups going to be? How will the cross matchups work? The alignments, Derek Kramer and I going to dive into all of it today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, y'all? Happy Wednesday and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers as always. My name is Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI. And today, let's dive into Pacers Bucks head first into a bunch of key storylines from a Pacers perspective in this series, some matchups, looking back at the regular season, the changes between the teams, how will this alignments work? Lots of craziness you can expect, I think, in the matchups in this series. And Derek Kramer and I break it all down. Stats, analysis, ideas, the benches, all sorts of stuff that we dive into today in a first glance look at Pacers Bucks, mostly from a Pacers perspective. Today we'll have Bucks people on on Friday, tomorrow. Me by myself. We'll see how much I do this weekend. There's only so much season pre series previewing that can be done, but lots more coming on the series. Started today with Derek Kramer for my Pacers blog. Let's just get right to it. Pacers and Bucks. Let's dive in the Pacers' first series since 2020. Their first series with games in Indianapolis since Tyreek Evans was balling against the Kyrie Celtics in 2019. It's been a while. There's going to be a lot of fun stuff to talk about. And here to break it down with me, somebody who only tracked like one third of Miles Turner's total blocks to date now because it was 2019. He hadn't blocked as many shots. It's Derek Kramer of iPacers block. He's back. Derek, are you excited for the series? Oh, it's just so uh, great to have the Pacers back in the postseason uh, with a very good chance of winning a game in the postseason as well. It's been even longer since that happened. Uh, like, let's just as long as we get a competitive series for the first time since that uh, Victor Oladipo crazy year, uh, seven game series against LeBron. Like that's at minimum. That's what I want to see. Like just a, a competitive playoff basketball series. Uh, it's been too long. They were like in every game in that Celtics series. I think they were up in the fourth quarter two or three times, but. It never felt like it. And then the heat series was just like down. Nine. It's like they were permanently down nine that whole series. <laughs> it was, it was very painful. Yeah. I don't know who I'm going to pick to win yet. Um, injuries are going to play a big factor. That makes it kind of hard to make predictions anyway, but I think the Pacers, I would be shocked if they got swept. Right. And I think that's a huge step forward for, for them and where they are. And that also is a factor of the health here. Um, where I want to kind of start is a big picture question for you. And that is they played the bucks a lot this season. And I think this was kind of the key topic at practice today, or at least that I was kind of wondering what players would say. They played the bucks five times this season, but the, you know, you were there Sunday after the Pacers Hawks and all the players were like, yeah, you know, you, we don't want to look back at the regular season. We don't know how much to draw from that. And it's obvious how like, like generically how big the changes are since then. Right. Doc rivers, instead of Adrian Griffin, Siakam in, nobody, no Bruce Brown, McDermott in, he might like play like that does matter. I don't think he'll play very much. Patrick Beverly in, he actually will play a lot despite being a minimum guy who was traded for a second round pick. No campaign. Uh, I think I got everybody who played or mattered at least in these games. Like it's way different. It's way different. Jay Crowder missed some of the games. Um, yeah, they just there's a lot that's changed. So it, it's not nothing, right? Like the it, really what's interesting is the Bucks have like six or seven guys from their team that won the title and played Jalen Smith's team in the 2021 finals or the same team that played Aaron Neesmith in the 2022 second round. So like there are guys that have seen this before in the playoffs with the Bucks, and they have a lot of the same personnel, but how much do you think you can and can't draw from the five games we've already seen the Pacers and Bucks play given how many changes there have been? I don't, I don't think there's a ton. I like, I think the Pacers need to take the confidence and like, take that from it like we they know they can beat the bucks but uh, honestly i think the biggest one of the biggest reasons that they went for and won against the bucks is just adrian griffin wasn't that great um so like i'm not the huge doc 
Doc Rivers guy. Obviously, the Bucks have had their issues since then. There's all these injuries, but I don't think there's a ton you can really take away in terms of this playoff series. Like it just feels like both teams are so different. Um, just look, just the Bucks transition defense um, alone is just so just night and day difference between like I think I looked up the Bucks transition D since the All Star break is like fifth best in the league now, the fifth fewest opponent fast break points and. Like there were so many buckets that just Obi Toppin would get just beating the Bucks down the floor after made baskets. So like that's very different just with that. Um, their defensive scheme. I know Tyrese mentioned today, like the they were kind of seeing if they could put Brooke at the level on picks instead of just his classic drop coverage. And now they're just back into their bud ways, if you will, of having him back um almost just full time, not trying to scheme any differently with that, which might be better for the Pacers. Like Tyrese loves drop coverage. Um, but like, that's just also something that the Bucks are much more comfortable doing. So like, I don't, I don't know how much you can take away from that beyond like just the confidence that, you know, like most of your players have had a ton of success against most of their players this season. Yeah. So like when you look back at the, or when I look back at the in-season tournament semifinal game, right? I vividly remember like three or four times that game where the Bucks would score. And then Isaiah Jackson would just sprint in a straight line and get a transition basket. And they, the Bucks scored. This wasn't like a fast break. He had just run straight like that. They were that bad at transition defense then. And so part of the pivot they've gone through under Doc is cleaning that up. And like, you can see the classic Bucks numbers, that you saw under Mike Budenholzer now where their offensive rebound rate is pretty low, like bottom five, bottom six in the league because they're getting back. They don't care about the offensive glass as much. And that trade-off has helped them in that way. And they've still struggled in other ways, but yeah, like clearly that is a change they made. Like it's been very well reported that they, they had their defensive scheme that Tyrese talked about today where Rick Lopez was up high and all the Bucks players were like, yo, Adrian, like we had this thing going that was really good where he'd like stand back there. You know, and they, and they changed that even from like the first Pacers game to the last. And that doesn't even account for like Siakam is now <laughs> Pascal Siakam is now on the Pacers, right? Like that alone is even beyond these th things that change for the Bucks, a big change for the Pacers and what things they could do defensively and offensively and their spacing and all. So, like in terms of the way, like the things the Bucks were good and bad at at the time, I'm throwing those out the window. What I'm not throwing out the window is like individual skill strengths and weaknesses. And I only say that because. You you probably heard me say this. Like I said, I've said this a million times about the Bucks this year. Part of what made the Pacers have so much success against them, even beyond the transition stuff, is like campaign Damian Lillard and Malik Beasley couldn't stay in front of anybody on the Pacers, right? So like every Pacers guard, McConnell, Brown, Heald, Halliburton, whoever, Matherin was great, great against the Bucks this season. He guarded Giannis really well in that one game, right? Like that, that kind of stuff, those guys aren't just going to be magically better defenders in the playoffs, right? So that I can take from that, but that's not specific to Pacers Bucks. You know what I mean? So like you you learn those things from those games, and that's part of the reason the Pacers went four and one against the Bucks, which is why I bring it up. That's the kind of stuff that I will be pulling from heading into this. But I agree with you that a lot of the you know, transition stuff, how Lopez is defending, how Halliburton's rolling every time, how Matherin looks good. Obviously, that's a big deal. He's not even playing. Like, that stuff just does not matter at all. And the game will be played at a different pace because it's the postseason. How much? We'll see. So, one, you got to work on your Rocky impression. Yo, Adrian! <laughs> let's play drop coverage! <laughs> Uh, yeah, that I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. Just, just maybe thinking when you said yo, Adrian. <laughs> um, second, like, like you said, like Malik Beasley. There's that that viral clip where Tyrese kind of like points <laughs> for a screen, and then he's just standing there. Yeah. There's literally a traffic cone. Like literally, he doesn't move. Tyrese just goes right by him, and he just kind of pivots and watches him blow by. Like I don't think we're gonna see Malik Beasley guard Tyrese Halbert. Like I think that's one gonna be one of the big things. It's gonna be no. different. Um, like Pat Bev's going to be better on that end than Cameron Payne. Like it's just no brainer. Like that's, that's an obvious a difference in what the Bucks are going to look like. Um, I'm trying to remember all the, you, you got nailed a lot of points there. Um, <laughs> another thing with uh, buds, like they're back in their bud ways, like with their drop coverage, like they're not forcing a lot of turnovers and the Pacers yep. are 
like having the least amount of turnovers, like opponents points off turnovers, I think since the all-star break, there are one or two in that. Um, so that kind of plays into the Pacer strengths. Like they're not going to turn over the ball anyway. So it'll be really interesting to see like how low the Pacers can keep those turnovers against a team. That's not trying to turn you over. They're just trying to make you take difficult shots. Um, so that's another thing I'm interested in seeing, but yeah, like I don't, I think the just the matchups alone are going to change a lot, and I know we're going to hit that yeah. later. Hey, y'all, short little break here so we can talk about two wonderful groups of people. First up, the good folks over at Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Well, our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level, like the 2024 Nissan Rogue. It's perfect for city drives and great escapes. Their classic exclusive Google built-ins is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3-inch touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. There's also the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder and the Nissan Armada. It'll change what you expect from a full-size SUV. The 2024 Nissan Armada picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to 8 in first-class luxury and style. Toe bigger. Explore further with the 2024 Nissan Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go explore and find your next big adventure. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. We also have to talk about Monopoly Go. Those who know me know I can be pretty competitive, and we've all been there. Either as a player or fan, it's halftime. The scoreboard's not looking good. You're feeling low. Not sure. You or your team can plot to win. That's when you dig deep, lift your head up, and say to yourself, time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heists, and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right. The hit smash mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards, to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. Play with countless on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. Make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. Charge other players for rent on your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb those leaderboards. So get back out there, put on your game face, and download Monopoly Go, now free in the App Store or Google Play. So the other question I have related to the Pacers in the postseason is less about the Bucks, but still like a difference between the regular season Pacers Bucks games and the postseason Pacers Bucks games is look, this goes back to last May, right? We're at the draft lottery. We're talking to Tyrese Halliburton, and I'm asking about the playoffs, what he's watching, what he's learning. He's like, I watch every game I can. I'm texting Kevin Pritchard. I'm texting Chad Buchanan. I'm texting Rick about what I'm seeing, what it's going to mean for us. And I said, well, can you tell me some of those things? He's like, half court offense matters a lot in the playoffs, right? And that's like a known thing. And it's the trope that the game is slowed down. And the Pacers, they they slowed down a little as the season progressed, but like they still finished top two in pace. I think only the Wizards were faster. So come playoff time, will that commonly accepted thinking that the game slows down? Well, what will that mean for the Pacers, if anything, right? Are they going to slow down? Can they still play random and be really tough for the Bucks to read and play fast and keep the ball popping? Or is it going to be really hard against a team that's dialed into what you're doing and trying to not let you play that way to play like the Pacers have and do at their absolute best? That's not necessarily specific to the Bucks, but in a little bit of a way it is because their pace really threw off the Bucks during the regular season, like, in a slowed down game, one, what do the Pacers look like at all? And two, can they be effective enough to still like be a top? What, you know, would have been the best offense ever had the Boston Celtics not existed this season. Yeah. And I think you, uh, like you have to be confident in the Pacers half court offense. They're one of the, the best half court offenses. Like they, they have the reputation of being this transition. That's how they score, but they're very effective in the half court. Um, so you like you're you're confident if you're the Pacers like that you can execute in that, and then it's just a matter of like how how does your how easy is the random flow game, or how difficult is that for the Bucks to kind of scheme against and game plan against when they have the whole playoffs to prepare for it, and we don't we haven't seen that yet. We don't know what that's going to look like um, when a team is only focusing on your offense and your tendencies and all of that stuff. And that's yeah. kind of the best part about playoff basketball is seeing how your 
players react to that and how how they f- face up against teams that are game planning against their every strength and every weakness. And they know the counters that are coming and they know the counters to those counters. And that that's why I, in theory, like in my brain, when someone says, talks about the Pacers playing random offense, it's, it's not random, truly. Like they have to, they have to have a sense of what's happening to be able to react and do things that make sense. But it is like not scripted, you know, like it, it's very reacting to what else is going on in a way that they understand it really well, but can be difficult for opponents. And, you know, I remember I, uh, a couple of Pacers players talking about this last year, like Daniel Tice was talking about it with this, with the Celtics when they played against them, like other teams were like, didn't know what to expect playing the Pacers. It was really hard. So it was just fast and random. And so can that actually work? Like, can you get to the playoffs and play random in a way that the Bucks who are going to like Siakam described, have a book of your plays and know all your tendencies left and right and hammered into your brain ahead of four to seven games in a row against the same opponent. Can you wiggle free from that? Can you play in a way that, that is so unpredictable or complicated that it, it doesn't matter and your half court offense can hum and your tra- transition offense can hum. And I think that's possible, but I don't know. And I've never seen the Pacers in that setting. So I also wonder what their response is going to be as a young team. If they go, Oh, <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> what, what, what do we do now? You know? And, and that's where someone like Rick has to really show his like, Hey, let's, I've done this before. We've got this, you know, all the guys who've been in the finals before, you know, but the prep's different and the execution's different. So that, that is my final, like, just big question that is adjacently related to the regular season matchups. Yeah. And I think one of the kind of the, in that realm, like the part of the Bucks coaching staff change was bringing in a guy that's worked with doc a lot and was with the Kings during Tyrese's rookie year. I think Tyrese brought that up today at practice. Um, So like, Yep. You know how, yep. yeah, you know how well the the Kings have kind of game planned against Tyrese, which obviously they have a defender who's kind of helped with that in some of those games when Davion Mitchell that can make anybody's life tough on that end. Um, so you wonder like how much of that kind of gamesmanship is going to be going on and uh, kind of playing playing them how the Kings might play Tyrese if that's how the Bucks are going to kind of approach things. Yeah, I am endlessly fascinated by this. But I agree with you in general, and the Pacers said this to my face, so I'm inclined to believe them. The five games that happened, forget about it. it it's a, it, You learn some stuff from it. You maybe, I think you're right, are more confident as a result of them, but you can't, I don't think it'd be smart to say, oh, they beat the Bucks four to five times. They will do well, will do well in this matchup. The other factors that make that very challenging is Giannis. Uh, more, I mean, more reporting from Woj, Derek. Giannis might miss a game, might miss two. Like, I hate that it's going to be a storyline is when is game two? What day of the week is game two? And we got report number two, Eric name in Milwaukee. Apparently Damian Lillard didn't practice on Tuesday. I'm going to make sure I have this right before I got it wrong. Uh, Doc River said, no, Damian Lillard was not able to practice. Uh, And he, they've done imaging apparently. Um, So, (laughs) My God, what is this Bucks team going to be? So that is fascinating to me. Uh, you can look back at the Bucks, uh, though, and say, yeah, you know, they might be hurt and Giannis might be out. But like Thanasis and uh, Pat Connaughton and Chris Middleton and Brooke Lopez. And uh, there's two more. I just ran through the list of all the Bucks that were on their team Bobby when they were on the title. Like, Did you say Bobby? They they know how to win in the playoffs. So Bobby Portis, yeah. Um, I missed, I, I did not. Bobby Portis is one. I'm missing one more. It's like, they're still going to be good and tough to beat. Like, I'm not just thinking, oh, the stars are out. It'll be easier. Uh, but it is, <laughs> it is helpful for the Pacers in that way. So matchups, uh, let me start a very lobby loaded one to you. Who are you putting on Dame? And is it Andrew Nimhard? Yeah, I think the, the obvious choice is to put Andrew Nimhard on Damian Lillard. Um, there's there's no other, like maybe you would think about Neesmith, but you probably want Neesmith either on Middleton if Giannis is out or you're going to just put him on Giannis. Um, so like, yeah, Nimhard's the obvious choice and that's probably who Dame's going to guard too. So it's not even going to be like a cross match situation. Um, so I think they just I agree. like that. And I think it'll be the same thing with Pat Bev and Tyrese. Like they're probably going to guard each other as well. Um, that makes the most sense for Tyrese, and that's like the obvious place. Like also that's why great. you would keep, why you would keep Pat Bev 
in the starting lineup um, is to guard Tyrese. So I think like those two things just kind of match up with, for exactly what the other teams would be looking for. You have the kind of defensive guy first guarding the primary ball handler or scoring option guy trying to sneak through the screens um, on the pick and roll and everything. And then the, the big situation is kind of where like things might be cross matchy. So the reason I generically ask about Dame first is because it, you know, it's so obvious to just like, this guy's on that guy, this guy's on that guy. This, this is all the cross matching and we're going to do it in the front court too. So I'm going to step on my own toes later. But the reason I wanted to start with Dame is Giannis is a multi-man operation. Like the best game the Pacers played against him this season and a lot of teams have had success with this, is when they form the wall that when he sees it, he like stops and thinks for a second. And I remember after that game, him talking in the in the away locker room in Gamebridge Fieldhouse about how he is naturally a pass-first player. I don't think of Giannis that way, but he said it about himself. I'm inclined to believe people talking about themselves. And so like that strategy can work. And Giannis will lock into a game plan and and figure out how to beat that stuff. He's done it. He's won a championship. Like he's beaten that coverage before, but like that is what, how you guard Giannis. You don't put Pascal Siakam on Giannis. And you're like, yep, we're good. We got it. Like that's not going to happen. So that the ripple effect from that is you almost have to be able to slow Dame with fewer resources because you're putting so many of them on Giannis. And so Nemhard could be it. Neesmith could be it at times. Perhaps that's an adjustment that could happen. Like we just saw against the Cavs, Neesmith started the second half on Donovan Mitchell in a regular season game, right? And then you use Nemhard in a different way on Middleton or a shooter or whatever, or just di- have him help a ton with Giannis. You know, who knows? But if you can limit Dame as much as feasibly possible with one person, and I'm not saying that's even possible. Like, Dame could have an otherworldly series and the Pacers just lose. But if Nemhard can deter him in any way, by himself, or at least with not like a ton of extra scheming help, that goes a long way. Not only slowing Dame down, but also slowing Giannis down, which is why I think that is the matchup to start with because it's almost like an inverse ripple effect on how you can defend their actual best player. Yeah, and I think uh, like what you're saying about Giannis with the wall, like maybe if he's not at full strength, he's going to be more likely to kind of give in to that when there's multiple defenders, like which like the whole of both injuries right now, Giannis and Dame kind of feel like Admiral Akbar, it's a trap. <laughs> like until both of those guys are declared out before game one, or, or even like a, Dame seems very unlikely. It seems like it was just rest. But until either of those guys are actually declared out, like I fully expect them to just, they're, they'll be healthy and ready to go at game one. And I'm sure that's how the Pacers are approaching things as well. Who would you, you're, you're Rick Carlisle, Derek. Who are you using as scout team? Team Giannis on the roster. Uh, scout team Giannis, like it, like Jarris, like is that the the best guy who doesn't play? Is that, like, I think Jarris is the move too. James Johnson, you are scout team. Giannis. I don't know who it actually is. Um, I remember Alex Poitras on this very podcast telling me when he was scout team LeBron in 2018. So uh, I I am looking forward to learning who scout team Giannis is. I don't even know how much they've focused on their stuff versus Bucks stuff versus all that kind of stuff. So uh, you uh, got, we got Dame. I agree with you that Halliburton will be on Beverly and Beverly will be on Halliburton. So that one seems pretty easy. I do wonder if the Bucks first lineup adjustment could be either Beasley in if they're not scoring enough or Jay Crowder in to get some size and still try to guard Halliburton that way. And then Halliburton would guard Jay Crowder. And one more break here, guys. We have got to talk about FanDuel. It is playoff time in the NBA and the NHL. Baseball is in full swing. Go Phillies. FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. And right now, with all that action going on in the sports world, new customers on FanDuel get $150. That's a lot in bonus bets guaranteed. How about that? That's $150. Win or lose. You just sign up. You can bet on everything from slot shots to home runs, to slam dunks on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. And then it gets tricky because 
it's similar to what I what we just talked about with Dame and like one guy on one guy. Like in my naturally in my brain, I'm like an East Smith on Middleton, but like Chris Middleton is a killer. And in the playoffs, he's been ridiculous. And he's got like four inches on East Smith. So like that's a hard one on one matchup. And you almost need Neesmith Smith to be like guy number two to help with Siakam on Giannis or Turner on Giannis. We can debate who should be on who there. So that one is is going to be a very interesting matchup to me. And then what do the Bucks do with with Middleton, Giannis, and Lopez, and who are they all guard? Because you could make an argument that if Siakam's going to be setting all the screens for Halberton, you want Brook Lopez on Pascal Siakam, and then Giannis can guard Neesmith and Rome a little more, and Middleton on Turner. I like that trio of how that all sorts out will be fascinating to me. And then if that goes poorly for the Pacers, either from a lineup perspective or from a cross-matching perspective, is that where they look to make their first adjustment either by like starting OB or going bigger with their group and like that, that is where this gets really complicated to me. Yeah. I think uh, I agree the, those whole trio and how they decide who matches up with who and what the Bucks do as well. I kind of expect that the Bucks will at least try putting Brook on Pascal and kind of I seeing agree. if, seeing if Pascal's shooting um, like can hold up against that deep drop. Although like, like we've talked about, like very confident in Pascal's threes from the corners, but above the break just doesn't, it just doesn't feel as like it's going in as much. Um, so how they kind of do that, like I think they'll probably go with Neesmith on Giannis and then Pascal. Ooh. Pascal wow. on Middleton is my guess because that's what they've done with those bigger wings even since Pascal's been back. Like Nismith's still been the guy that covers those bigger wings, which Giannis is obviously a different beast than all of those guys. But that's my guess is what they'll try first. That's interesting. My inclination was Turner on on Giannis to start the <laughs> but here so here's where it gets tricky is like whoever and, and, and Giannis might not play it, then the, you have to think differently about the matchups. But I think that like I was at practice today, I was just kind of thinking this like Ben Shepard in his second team shirt and Doug McDermott in his second team shirt. Like you don't want to rely on a rookie or kind of like an inconsistent, whatever you'd call McDermott right now. But you have like wing depth that I think they're going to need not because they are like desperate to rely on those guys in the playoffs, but because Neesmith is going to foul guarding Giannis or whoever is guarding Giannis. Like whoever's on Giannis is going to rack up fouls, Pascal, whoever. And so I I think in my brain, Turner on Giannis, because he's going to be a screener a lot, does make a lot of sense. But you have less, less like center depth for creative rotations if Turner's in foul trouble. It's just player backups more. Whereas you can do more stuff with the wings and have more options. Uh, but, you know, McDermott can't be on anybody. <laughs> and Shepard is a rookie who you like definitely aren't having be a Giannis stopper. So th there's a lot of like secondary, what your reserves are impact on who they're. I, my, my natural thought was Turner on Giannis, Neesmith on uh, Middleton and Siakam on Lopez. But I think I get what you're saying with, Neesmith on Giannis, but when's the last time they, was it Matherin? I guess that when they went to somebody that small on him. Yeah. Matherin definitely guarded him. I like Neesmith. Wow. Had, and Neesmith. well, yes. Yeah. Like that's the, like we haven't even talked about Matherin being out as part of why this matchup is different. Um, and he had some, some of his best games of the season came against the bucks with some yep. huge stops late against Giannis. He had like 25 point, 13 rebound game. Um, some multiple, very uh, good games for, for Ben. Um, Neesmith guarded, guarded Giannis a lot in that end season tournament game, uh, for sure. Um, like I, I just think that's probably where they that's go. Right. I, I like Turner as kind of the guy that's guarding Lopez, although both teams probably like will let the center shoot the three if that's who they're guarding or whoever Turner yes. and Lopez are guarding, they're going to kind of be okay with that guy taking a three. I like Turner as that guy who can kind of come over and help with the honest wall um turners speaking of the miles high club uh has blocked Giannis 22 times which is second most in his career partially because 
he's in the division. He plays him all the time. Um, but this playoff series, just a side note, he could be become the most frequent flyer of the Miles High Club if uh, any amount of blocks happen because he's only yes. one behind Andre Drummond. Hey, what if Drummond's Bulls get the eight seed and in the conference finals is Pacers <laughs> Bulls? Then maybe we could have a, a scenario. So the Bulls the where the, That's what uh, you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, no, we throw out the regular season. We said, um, yeah. And so it, it's funny you mentioned that because like, I, I, I was going to think the same thing about Brooke Lopez. Like if you're the Pacers, uh, like you won't, if you're having to give up something, it's going to be Brooke Lopez threes. Like if Brooke Lopez goes four for five from deep in a game, you might just lose that game. But I think the flip side might be too true or it's miles Turner goes four for five from deep in a game. The Pacers have a really good shot in the same way. And so does that influence where those teams want to put those centers defensively on what player and the other thing of maybe against or for depending on what the teams end up doing a lot is like if Turner's on Giannis which was my suggestion just now well then if your perimeter defense sucks as the Pacers in this series which it might like there it just was terrible against the Cavs in a big game last Friday like Turner won't be around the basket or like won't be able to help if he's guarding Giannis as much or also just be like dupe little easy dump off easy basket for the Bucks. And so that puts a lot of pressure on that in a way that's like if Turner's on Brooke Lopez and he's willing to live with those threes, he can at least help clean up around the basket. And then you make Brooke Lopez beat you instead of the driver. But that's going to be mitigated with good perimeter defense. So um, it's tough to like that could be a factor as well in how they decide. And again, maybe this is their first adjustments. Like, let's change how this is going. Let's see if we put somebody on somebody else. And and Siakam's defensive role specifically, like he he hasn't been as impactful defensively as I thought he'd be. Like who he maybe he just ends up on Middleton because of that because Middleton's good, but he hasn't been as good with all his injuries. Uh, the it's endlessly fascinating, but I think it's possible that nobody ends up guarding their natural position in, in on either team in the in the opening five, and I think that's fascinating. Yeah, it is super interesting. The but I, yeah, I I think Pascal has a better chance. Uh, well, anybody does, but I think Pascal makes more sense against Middleton than Neesmith does, which is part of why I like the Pascal on Middleton thing. Um, Cause I feel like Middleton, like jump shooting, having that height advantage over Neesmith could just kind of post him up and not have to do much, but turn around and shoot over him, um, which you don't have to worry about as much with Giannis. Cause he's, if he takes a jump shot, that's a win for you. Yes, for sure. So if Giannis does, what, what do you think, the Bucks will do if Giannis can't play game one. How do you think they'll line up? I think they'll – I was trying to look and see, like, who they had started recently. It seems and I, like, and I, I'll just guess first. I think they'd start Bobby Portis. Is that what you think? That's what, Yeah, that's what I thought. And then when I looked to see what they did in the last few games, like, that's who they started um, in his place. And, I, like, he's played really well lately from what I've seen. Um, so then I think you would go with Pascal on Bobby and then Neesmith on Middleton. Then it's, maybe, then it's more natural. It's very straightforward. Yeah. But then you do have the issue of like what we just talked about where Neesmith with the height disadvantage trying to guard Middleton. So yeah. then if Middleton is Middleton, then that becomes the, the challenge. Yeah. Middle, Middleton's not what like he used to be. What's he three time, four time all-star, but that dude in the playoffs for forever has just been like lights freaking out. Like I, I'm not bending against that dude until I see it happen. Um, the other funky thing about the, you know, I'm not saying this helps the Bucks per se with air quotes, but like one tricky part of cross matchup matching is off a miss picking up in transitions confusing because like the guy who guarded you is not necessarily who you're guarding or who you hope to guard. And so for a less good transition team in the Bucks, I'll be curious what that ends up looking like or if that ends up being a problem for them. But I agree with you. I think that should Giannis not go, it would be Dame, Beverly, Middleton, Portis, and Lopez. I wondered if they could go Jay Crowder and Middleton at the four and try to just go Dame with as much shooting as they can. And then I, I feel like, because Beverly, they the, the Halliburton thing, like we've seen it in the past even, like I feel like they're going to start him into the series. Maybe it's Beasley, just something to get the shooting out there to make the Pacers defend more in space. And then hopefully that can get Dame going if you're the Bucks. And if Look, if Dame can't play, which uh, it's way too early to even guess what his status is going to be. If Dame can't play, then I have no idea what the situation's going to be. But um, yeah, I think that that with Portis in there is at least more straightforward, but then the cross matching is easier in transition. But yeah, I think that obviously is a huge help to the Pacers if he can't play. Uh, yeah. Any bench matchups stand out to you at all? Or is it, I think that's way more straightforward in general. 
yeah, I think I'm not as like there's not as much kind of yeah that you need to worry about necessarily with the bench. Unique just, skill sets. Yeah, can the bench be as impactful and just like outright awesome as it has been like since the All Star break and like is how is the TJ McConnell um, like. The, they might guard him with Brook Lopez at times because teams have put centers on him and then just like dared and dared him to shoot. Uh, we saw what he did against the Hawks. Of course, that's the Hawks. And uh, <laughs> there are Rucker Park League defense, as uh, Rick was saying about both teams. But um, so he hit three he hit three threes there. So hopefully he didn't use them all up, I guess you're thinking, if, if you're the Pacers. Um, but he's been so fantastic. Obi Toppin's been fantastic off the bench. They both have the highest two net ratings among any rotation player um, that's like consistently been in the rotation. Isaiah Jackson's is like off the charts, but he hasn't played as many games um, and he's got some garbage time minutes kind of messing with that as well. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see like which backup center ends up being the guy, like if sticks holds on to it or if he struggles and then Isaiah Jackson gets a shot. I think that's something to watch. I hope that Doug McDermott does not play at all. Like, I think you just go nine and then, like, use a, use Neesmith or use well, the Occam with those four starters. What about eight? Could you go, oh, if you just take, like, Shep out, if you, if you don't think he's ready and consistent enough. He has, like, he hasn't looked as good lately. He's not hitting as many shots. So I could definitely see them cutting it all the way down to eight. I think that would be tough. It would be hard. Just minutes wise. It would be particularly, like, you're, you're playing Andrew Nemhard a lot if you're going to eight. And that's yeah. tricky. I think Shep's at least got to play 10, probably. Yeah. I think they'll start that way. I agree. So if you look at the Bucks rotation they used against the Magic in their final game of the season, which they win that, they're in two. Uh, I, I don't know how. It looks like they tried, given their rotation, and they just sucked in the game. Um, it's it's just the last game of the season's weird motivation. But just rotationally, they basically played eight with Crowder, uh, Connaughton, and Beasley as their bench. Which I point out to say, I think that it's pretty straightforward how like matching up lineups would go. The, the two curious things I have for the Pacers, one positive, one negative. Positive is, if McConnell is McConnell again, the best guy to put on him is the Bucks is Patrick Beverly. Like, are, is Patrick Beverly going to play 48 minutes a game in this series? Like, he can't, they, that's not possible, right? There's going to be some amount of time in the game where either Halbert nor McConnell, likely all McConnell minutes if you're the Bucks where he has a not good perimeter defender on him. Like, like the bet their probably next best option is like Pat Connaughton or Jay Crowder. I don't know. Maybe I'm selling somebody short. I'm not going to put Chris Middleton on TJ McConnell. Right. So that, that is uh, something I'll be curious about is if McConnell's magic keeps rolling and he's just 16 points automatically every night, that's a bench advantage. The Pacers can get the negative part is I don't see a good place for the Pacers to put Obi defensively. Uh, against that group because it's it's shooters or ball handlers who are at least moderately effective. And Obi has proven that even in matchups where his defense is a pretty good, he can stay on the floor by making threes and being really great offensively. But I think it's going to be tricky for him specifically in this series without a, an obvious spot to put him defensively. Especially, like if Jake Crowder is making shots, it's going to be really hard to give, to find where Obi goes defensively. Yeah, I do agree with that. I think he's got the toughest uh, kind of matchups to deal with among anyone in the roster, really. Like, that's a just a tough, but I like it's going to be whether he can keep up the 70% two point percentage that he has all season yeah, and the 40% threes. If he can do enough on the offensive end to kind of make up for anything he's going to give up, then it might, it won't matter because he's been that good offensively that he's been incredible despite any defensive shortcomings. Agreed. I can't wait. <laughs> so it's still somehow four days away. <laughs> uh, so still a lot to dissect. Um, although I want to get into a lot more about this series in future episodes, but I think this was a good primer for what this all looked like. Do you think we missed anything big from like a very zoomed out X's and O's perspective? I'm trying to think. Um, like the, I think we at least touched on most things. Um, like. It will be interesting, I think, like, if Obi does struggle, like, do the Pacers ever get to the point where they would try Jairus in that spot? Or, like, I think that's going to be tough. Like, he's had some big moments against good teams, but I don't know if Rick's going to 
like feel like he can put him in in this series, even if like they need a change in the bench in that way. Yeah, I don't. It may be like like Obi's offense is is more important than his defense. That's who he stays in the court, right? So, I, in that way, I don't think you go to Jarris because his offense can't reach that level, right? You know, I don't know. I, we were already questioning if they can play Ben Shepard. Like, are they going to go to a rookie who hasn't been as good? I just, I have trouble seeing that. But that's that's the hardest part of this to me is the reserve front court for the Pacers. Mather would be huge in this series, right? Like. This is where like, we could talk about what happened in the regular season with how the team changed without him, but this is a series where he would have certainly helped, right? He proved that in the regular season. So I think that's endlessly fascinating. The Lakers are up four with about five minutes to go. Derek, we'll see if that holds. That is relevant because Lakers Nuggets will get great TV time slots and Pelicans Nuggets will not. We still don't know when this series will start, when game two is going to be. The TV networks rue the day. They dominate. They are the decider. So we will see, but you know, it's coming on Sunday. So tomorrow I'll do a solo show talking about some other key topics heading into the series. Neesmith and Jalen Smith's past series against the bucks. Can the young Pacers, what's it going to look like in their first playoff series? We just talked about three guys in great detail, having roles in the series who have never played a playoff game before Ben Shepard, Andrew Nemhard, And of course, Ty Reese Halliburton. It's in his home state. There's just a lot of very interesting factors. I mean, they won't, they'll have a week off. Maybe that can help his health. Maybe he'll look awesome. There's so much to dive into still leading into the series. Derek, thank you for the time. Where can people find your coverage of the Pacers, what this series is going to look like, and you will be at the games in Indy for the series as well. So lots of on-the-ground coverage. Yes, nothing uh, official yet, but I'm hoping to be there in person to cover uh, oh, the home playoff I, games. I you, all good. Sorry. All good. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I want to, I want to make one prediction. We just talked all about these matchups and I think the bucks are going to play a lot of zone and I agree. the matchups, the matchups aren't going to matter. And that might be what kind of messes with the Pacers flow offense because they, they have like looked kind of flummoxed by a zone a lot. And even though they know what to do, it's like they, that messes them up. So I think we're going to see a lot of zone, um, from the Bucks, so all that matchup talk might be for not, at least for who the Bucks are going to put on who. Um, uh, they can find my work on ipacers.com. A couple new articles on uh, Obi and TJ recently, if you haven't seen them. Uh, a bunch of new t-shirts. Um, this is one of my older ones, but there's some uh, other ones that are out. So check them out. You can find them on my Twitter page. Any article will have a little thing on it, but uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. He'll be back as the series progresses. Or if there's another series that we have to do this exact exercise for, we will see. <laughs> yes, Pacers uh, Bulls in the conference finals. Yeah, we, we <laughs> which implies the Pacers will win their second round series against opponent TBD. Uh, the day this comes out is East Plans Night. So tonight you will find out who joins the Pacers side of the bracket between the Heat and the Sixers. I expressed my opinion yesterday. The Pacers should hope it's the Heat, but... Do you really want to hope it's the Heat in the playoffs? I've it's a lose lose. <laughs> That's just a, <laughs> one of them's coming into their side of the bracket. Back tomorrow, talking more Pacers ahead of the playoffs. Really looking forward to it. So much fun to be covering these series again. Follow Derek. Thank you all for listening. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you soon.